east of Port Stanley. We can actually see it in the background, <laughs> which is really neat. On average, it drops 3.4 meters a year of like just sediment into wow. the lake. Hi everyone, my name's Emily Febri. I'm also known as Ranger M. I'm an environmental communicator and educator, and I get to talk to a lot of different people about all things nature and conservation. I love to knowledge share, and that's what I want to do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Hi everyone. Did you know there's 21 natural areas known as environmentally significant areas, or ESAs, in the city of London? ESAs are natural areas that are designated significant because of the natural wildlife and the habitats they contain. They could contain wetlands, forests, meadows, prairies, rivers and streams that all provide necessary habitat for our wildlife. Having 21 in a major urban area is significant and great for the city and the community to have natural spaces to observe wildlife and enjoy the recreational opportunities provided. Today we're at the Westminster Ponds ESA, which is one of the largest ones found in the City of London, at over 250 hectares. It's also very well known for its natural landscapes and all of the wildlife you can observe here. This area is also significant because of its history. This is the traditional lands of the Attawandaran, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Lunape peoples. They were the first ones to interact with the land from cultivating it to protecting it. They shaped our landscape for thousands of years. Then fast forward to European settlement, where more farming and an urban center was created. Then in the 1900s, the hospital put in some facilities for veterans, a sanitary landfill site was added, and then finally in the 1970s, the City of London and the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority purchased it and made it into what we now know and love as the Westminster Ponds environmentally significant area. Today we're going to discuss all the amazing habitats we can find in one ecosystem and I couldn't think of a better place than Westminster Ponds. Habitat is defined as a space that provides an animal with all the requirements it needs to survive. For us humans that could be our home but for animals that could be one tree, a pond or even a fallen log. Every living species needs four basic requirements to survive food, water, space, and shelter. This ESA is an important stopover for many different bird species like migratory birds, songbirds, and water birds. But even if we're an urban center, we don't miss out on mammals either. Coyotes, beavers, and white-tailed deer are common sight here. If you walk around the ponds, you can see uh, fish jumping, turtles and snakes basking, and you don't miss out on a mass amount of insects you can find here like damselflies and dragonflies. So let's go explore and see what we can find. Obviously a highlight when visiting Westminster ponds is the ponds. These ponds are what are called wetlands, and they're an amazing ecosystem that hosts a variety of wildlife from animals to plants. Wetlands are some of the most biologically diverse and productive habitats and ecosystems on the earth. Ontario hosts 25% of Canada's wetlands, and that equates to 6% of the world's wetlands, and that's amazing. Westminster Ponds is known as a provincially significant wetland, which means, based on an evaluation system, it is very valuable to the province of Ontario because of its ecological services and benefits it provides to the environment and society. So let's go take a closer look. Wetlands are an amazing e ecosystem to observe and learn about biodiversity because it's where two worlds collide, the aquatic and the terrestrial, meaning we can see even more animal and plant life. So if you take the aquatic side first, we have fish, amphibians, mollusks, and insects. And then we start to bring in the terrestrial animals like mammals, birds, and other amphibians and insects that live both in the water and on land or even just animals that live terrestrially, but that benefit from the aquatic world, making, making this a very important and biodiverse ecosystem. A great example to show how unique and special wetlands are is that some animals start their lives aquatically, and then when they reach a certain stage, they live terrestrially. Like a dragonfly. A dragonfly looks dramatically different as an adult and as a larva, because it starts in the water, and then when it reaches a certain stage, it comes out and lives terrestrially. Another reason wetlands make such a great habitat is that they have sheltered waters. So this means a fish can hide under a log in the water or that there's a tree line that protects these animals from the elements. Wetlands have the ability to provide nutrients to the wide variety of animal and plant lives here. So the soils in the water are very rich, clean and productive, allowing for a food web to be created and species to thrive. 
let's go find another habitat. The forests are as busy as the neighborhoods you live in or the schools you go to. You just have to look close enough to see all of the living things. Forests are an ecosystem, meaning they're made up of a lot of communities and different habitats that provide for a variety of species. Within a forest, you can consider one tree a habitat to several species. Birds will nest up in the treetops or they'll burrow around the base of a tree. Insects will go along the trunk or live in the roots of a tree. Now, a living tree isn't the only beneficial tree in a forest. Let's go find a cavity tree. A cavity tree or a wildlife tree are dead or dying standing trees that provide a habitat to a range of animals still. As an example, when this tree started dying, insects probably started burrowing into the trunk, eating away at the wood. A pileated woodpecker probably flew by one day, hearing the insects move along underneath the bark. So the pileated woodpecker started chipping away at the bark, creating what is known as a cavity, or the holes you see on the tree. Once the pileated woodpecker finished making this hole, it could have utilized it for a habitat itself, raising its young, or it could have flown away looking for other bugs in another tree. But after it left that cavity, many animals still would have used it for a habitat, like a flying squirrel or a wood duck. They would have raised their youngs in it. So you can see a cavity tree is very important to a forest. But even when a cavity tree falls, it is still vital to the ecosystem. Fallen logs retain moisture, decompose, and have a mossy covering that creates a microhabitat for an array of species. Birds and chipmunks find crevices to hide in, insects and salamanders love to live under here, and then fungi start to grow. Fallen logs are also a great starting place for seeds. So seeds that travel on wind get caught on the log, and since there's plenty of moisture and nutrients here, they actually have a really good starting point to grow and create a new habitat with all of the plants that grow on top of it. The forest floor, or the organic layer, where things really start to break down and decompose, is another habitat altogether. So the leaves and sticks and logs create cover for a an array of species. And then soil is where a lot of insects live. And this once again adds to the food chain and the, the ability for animals to survive. There's one more habitat at the Westminster Ponds that I want to show you. So let's go check out the meadows. Here we are in the Westminster Ponds meadows, another vital habitat to the landscape. You can find a similar habitat called tall grass prairies, but they do differ slightly. They both contain wildflowers, uh, grasses and few trees and host a variety of animal life. They mostly differ to how they are managed. So tall grass prairies are managed by fire, whereas meadows are managed by droughts or flooding. These habitats may sound like they're just field of grasses, but they're incredibly important. For one, over 200 plants and species of birds like the bobo link and mammals like the badger call them their only home. And these animals are very at risk and depend on these habitats. All of the ecosystems and habitats and the biodiversity in them that we explored today are experiencing increased pressure from climate change and human impacts. These habitats actually have naturally occurring mitigation methods towards climate change like carbon sequestration. So they have the ability to hold carbon within their roots, soil, water, and so on. But we have to help protect these habitats to ensure that these services can continue. Our local biodiversity cannot survive without habitats. And since European settlement, we have seen a dramatic decline in habitats and therefore biodiversity. This is especially prevalent in Southwestern Ontario's Carolinian life zone. To date, Southern Ontario alone has lost more than 70% of its wetland habitats, 98% of its grassland habitats, and 80% of its forest habitats. Over 200 plant and animal species are considered to be at risk of extinction in Ontario. To help save these species, we need to protect their habitat. So first we can protect spaces like this, but we can also consider our own property. When considering your own property, creating and maintaining wildlife habitat could be as easy as doing nothing and letting nature be, or it could be making a one or five year management plan for your property. Now that we have a good introduction to different habitats and especially meadows, I thought it would be a good idea to meet up with Peyton Landsborough of the Thames Talbot Land Trust. 
She's a budding botanist and a whiz when it comes to pollinators. So let's jet over to Hawks Cliff in Elgin County where they have a lot of restored habitat, including meadows and tall grass prairie and wildflowers and meet up with her. Well, Peyton, thank you so much for joining me today. I was hoping you could tell us a bit about yourself. I'm Peyton Lansborough. I'm primarily a field botanist, but at Thames Talbot Land Trust, I work as the stewardship and outreach coordinator. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so it's pretty fun. I get to go out into the field. I get to do the land management and base of species stuff. And then also I get to go out and do some educational opportunities and schools programming and work with volunteers. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the Thames Talbot Land Trust. I'm not even sure I know what a land trust is. <laughs> okay, well, Thames Talbot Land Trust, or TTLT for short, it's an organization, an environmental charity that manages about 25 nature reserves. I believe we have about 2,000 acres, and this is done in a variety of means. So uh, people will donate land, will purchase lands, and then also we work with conservation easements where uh, landowners want to make sure that their that their land is secured and uh, maintained in a good natural way for essentially the end of time. And so that's where we come in and we make an agreement with them to ensure that happens. So obviously we're in one of those natural areas now and we're at Hawk Cliff. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about this place and what makes it so special. Hawk Cliff Woods is a nature reserve that's 230 acres along the north shore of Lake Erie. Uh, we're just to the east of Port Stanley. We can actually see it in the background, which is really neat. <laughs> a clear day. <laughs> um, and something that's interesting about this is that the area we're actually standing in right now used to be an agricultural field. Oh, wow. So this property has a mix of uh, mature forest, even interior forest, and then uh, two restored meadows and a community wildflower garden. So it's pretty cool that we're right on the shoreline of Lake Erie. Like it's literally right there. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. It's, it's gorgeous. And something that's kind of interesting is that Lake Erie is actually the most biologically productive lake uh, for fisheries out of all of the Great Lakes, which is so wild considering that it was considered a dead lake like 20 years ago. Yeah. But meanwhile, it's just this incredibly biodiverse area. And specifically the North Shore, where we are standing right now, essentially, has the highest erosion rate of all of Lake Erie. Wow. So on average, it drops 3.4 meters a year of like just sediment into wow. the lake. So much sediment going in. But that sediment, is it important? Is it is it good that it's going in? Is it bad? It's a little bit of a mixed thing because like it's just the, it's because of the formation of the bluffs that we're standing on. They're a non-consolidated material, meaning that it's a mix of sand and clay. They can't, it can't really get balanced and like stabilize or anything. And so what happens is that when it falls in, there's these lake processes called littoral zones that swoop the sediment up along the shoreline to and to deposit it into different areas. So where we are right now, the littoral zone drops it down at Long Point. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's kind of helping create a habitat farther down. Yeah. <laughs> that Long Point is pretty important for reptiles yeah. and stuff. So, wow, that's neat. It's all connected in a way. Oh, it's a system. Awesome. And that Lake Erie is one of the most biologically diverse lakes in the Great Lakes. Like that's awesome too. I think it gets a pretty bad rep. So I think that's really important to share and that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to show here, us here at Hawks Cliff? I really want to show more of the restored meadow because I think it's absolutely fabulous. <laughs> I would love to see it. Let's go check it out. Okay. So welcome to the rest of the restored meadow. So behind us, we have three restored uh, wetlands in our meadow. We used to have four, but one of them fell off the cliff. <laughs> um, yeah, it just, it happens. <laughs> so this meadow, we seeded it in, I believe 2016 with I think over a hundred different species of wildflowers. Wow. And then we also put in some like oak, acorns and then just some like plum pits and just 
other things, our goal for this property is to actually let this restored meadow uh, succeed into a forest, which that would more than double the interior forest at Hawk Cliff. Is there a special importance to interior forest? Like, is that kind of, why is that your aim? So interior forest is incredibly rare in Southern Ontario. Like this is one of the few spots that have, that still has interior forest oh, wow. and like, it, it hosts uh, breeding habitat for stuff like red-headed woodpecker, oven birds, just like some bird species are really, really require interior forests. Otherwise they can't actually thrive and survive. Okay. So what is an interior forest compared to, you know, you, you walk into a forest and you think that's interior forest. Like, how do you know what interior forest is? So interior forest is usually where there is no edge within a hundred meters. The interior forest, like the, the, the real problem with like the lack of it is that edge habitats host a wider variety of non-native species. And like, you don't actually get like the same, the same moisture conditions, same like humidity conditions, whatever, uh, within that forest. And there's actually species that are like, plant species in addition to the birds that are just obligated to to live within that interior habitat and considering that we don't actually have much of that remaining on, in the landscape in southern Ontario that means that we are getting less and less opportunities to actually host those species and Ontario is a major migration zone for a wide variety of species. And we were talking about over at the cliff there that you see many different bird species. Oh yeah. But you also see a huge migration of monarch butterflies here as yeah. well, which yeah. is incredible. Yeah, this is a monarch uh, stopover point. So in the fall, you actually have like a bunch of monarchs that are just hanging out in the trees. And then also you have like all the hawks, like that's what Hawk Cliff is known for, the hawk migration. There's just a huge variety of birds here in addition to those hawks. We actually have cliff swallows that are hanging out and uh, nesting within the, the bluff edge, which those are actually a species at risk. Oh, wow. So could you tell us a bit about the relationship between wildflowers and pollinators? Like, wh why is it so important? It's super important because stepping away from just pollinators, but to insects more broadly, uh, plants are the foundation for insect development. And like, I know that there's there's often the perception of like, oh no, I don't want insects in my backyard because like they'll bite me. But so many insects are beneficial and they, they're they one of the foundations of the food chain, the, the food web with like birds and everything. So uh, insects have, uh, there's like obligate host plants that they need to complete some por portion of their life cycle. And when you have a wide diversity of flower species, that means that you're able to host a wide diversity of insects. And birds like chickadees, a single brood of chickadees requires something like 11 caterpillars a day wow. per bird, which like <laughs> if you don't have the host plants for those those insects, you, you don't have the habitat for the birds. Right. So is there certain species um, that of plants that are more important than others too? Yes, actually, uh, there's something called keystone species. So usually when we think of keystone species, we think of beavers, that they change the landscape, but there's, there's plants that are keystone species. And these are the plants that host the widest diversity of insects, which means that they, they host the widest diversity of all animals realistically. And so some examples of those are actually goldenrod. Really? Yeah, and like also black-eyed Susan, which are these gorgeous little yellow flowers that are surrounding us right now. And so these are the ones that they, well, I think black-eyed Susan hosts like over a hundred different species of moth and butterflies. Really? Yeah, and just that single plant alone does that. That's incredible. <laughs> so obviously when it comes to our food production, pollination is very important. Oh, for sure. And so protecting and restoring habitat for those pollinators is very important. So what you have here is incredibly vital. Um, but for those of us who uh, want to help out, but are very limited to mm -hmm. our property and we can't just put a meadow in, uh, what are your suggestions for what we can do to help our pollinators? Plant a native plant garden. Just like in your garden. <laughs> yep, it can even be in containers. Like yeah. there's there's many different species of plants that you can, like if you don't have like a backyard and you just have a balcony, you can you can plant 
species in, in containers. They work really well, like uh, butterfly milkweed, fantastic in a container. Same with like uh, the, the Rudbeckia, the black-eyed Susan. Oh, yeah. they, they work really well. And so uh, the Xerces Society actually emphasizes the importance of having different like pollinator strips, especially along farm fields. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of like, you know, your vegetable garden at home, if you just have like little pockets of native plants, you can, in addition to producing beautiful food, also know that you're helping the, the ecosystem as a whole. That's awesome. If someone, let's say, has a, a relatively big garden and they want to start switching over from non-natives to native wildflower species, what do you think that is a good kind of starting point? What would you suggest? Like anything or is there kind of easier plants to kind of get started in? Okay, so usually when introducing people to native plants, I usually tell them to go for like the Black Eyed Susans. I tell them to go for Scarlet Bee Balm. Ooh. Um, yeah, it's like the wild bergamot, but it's bright red. And so you bring like hummingbirds and it's also edible. Oh, it's, cool. it's delicious. So it's like, it's a great like oregano alternative. So it fits right into a vegetable garden. Okay. And then also like Dense Blazing Star and the Butterfly Milkweed. And those all have pretty colors. So it's like yeah. even more kind of welcoming to people because they're like, well, I still want the flower color aspect to my mm -hmm. garden. So that's, that's perfect. Um, and like you said, even people with, um, in apartments have options as well. And that'd be pretty neat. You know, you're up on the 15th floor mm -hmm. and you're kind of bringing pollinators even up there. Just see a little bumble bumblebee. <laughs> that would be pretty neat, you know? <laughs> so to get these people started, where could they get seeds? Is it, can you go to Walmart? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. So a lot of uh, packets that are labeled as wildflower seeds actually have invasive species. Oh, wildflower isn't some like specific definition of like a plant. It can mean from wildflower from anywhere. Um, so we at Hawk Cliff, uh, we actually have a community wildflower garden where people are welcome to come and collect seeds when they're ready. We actually even have signs that like uh, describe what the plant will look like, its height, where you, how you need to grow it, and also what to do when you collect the seeds. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. I'd actually like to go check that out if that's okay. That'd be great. Perfect. So this is an adorable little garden. So you were saying anyone could come as soon as like the seeds are ready? Yeah, so anyone can come anytime. Uh really True. just to come <laughs> come and see the garden. Um but the we have a variety of plants that are planted here and some of them are already have already gone to seed. And so it's like you can stop by whenever to collect the seeds and each sign will have instructions on how to process them, oh, where cool. to plant them. And it's just, it's a nice place to hang out and have lunch too. I mean, we've already seen so many different um, insects and butterflies while we've been even standing here. So it's, it's awesome just to come here and sit. I'd probably read a book here or something. Oh, for sure. <laughs> um, do you ever, do you need volunteers kind of to help run this garden or is yeah, there some way so, that people can get involved? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for the garden specifically, we meet monthly approximately with volunteers just to clean it up. We just like weed the paths, weed the gardens. And if there's like a plant within the path that, you know, that you're weeding up, like you're able to take it home. <laughs> like it's, it's pretty, pretty nice. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. Other than that, uh, Thames Talbot Land Trust in general has a volunteer program. So, you know, we have opportunities through Passport to Nature where you can either be like a volunteer shepherd on those hikes, or you can just attend a free event in nature, which is fun. Perfect. Uh, we also just have like a stewardship volunteer stream where you go out on the land with uh, the TTLT stewardship staff and you get to, you know, maybe install signs or you get to remove invasive species and really contribute to the land management. Awesome. Can they find that information on your website? Yes. Yeah. So we have all of that information on our website. So we have it under upcoming events. And then you can also uh, look at the get involved portion if you want to have a more specific volunteer role. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Peyton, today. It's been awesome exploring the meadow with you and learning all of your knowledge from field botany to um, about Lake Erie and everything in between. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks for watching. Until next time, see you in nature.